right, all right. Good morning, everybody. It's so fabulous to see you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for braving the weather. Uh, it's going to, like, fingers crossed, right? Uh, anytime you're planning an event, you always wonder what's going to happen with New England uh, weather. Um, so I'm Clara Yalinkova, uh, Vice President and University CIO, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the 11th Harvard IT Summit. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you again. Today, thank you. Today's program advances the summit's three pillars, to learn from each other, to connect with each other, and to connect to the mission of the university. We have an incredible lineup for you today, including the return of the beloved breakout session format, featuring 50 sessions by, led by staff and exhibitors. If you are running a session, if you are a presenter, please stand up, wave your hands, make yourself known. There, all right. Five years we waited for your return, and we are delighted to see you again in your breakout sessions. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, we will be joined by a very special guest to deliver our keynote address this afternoon, Art and cultural historian, Professor Sarah Lewis from the uh, Faculty Arts of Sciences, of Arts and Sciences, FAS, yay! Uh, it seems that the pace of technology is relentless and our appetite for it only keeps growing. As Harvard moves from being a fast follower in technology to a leader, we all experience uncertainty. We start to ask ourselves questions like, what do I tell my faculty about generative AI? What if I am wrong? Related to that uncertainty is risk, the willingness and the courage to fail, to be wrong, to shift gears, to engage in dialogue and disagreement. Each of you received a, cop a copy of Professor Lewis's book, The Rise at Registration. The book explores the concept of failure and its relationship to creativity and success. It emphasizes the importance of resilience, perseverance, the willingness to embrace failure as a crucial part of the journey towards excellence. Embracing the big dreaded F, an important message for all of us. We are thrilled to have uh, Professor Lewis join us and hope to see you this afternoon at the plenary session. And please get ready to ask questions because Professor Lewis agreed to have an open Q&A at the end of his, her session. I think we can all agree that this has been a year of innovation, both at the university centrally and across the schools. It has been amazing to see what we have achieved together. I was in awe as all of you rose to the occasion and quickly embraced generative AI. We have seen some incredible projects, innovation, and pilots to emerge, and several of which are going to be featured at the sessions today. But AI is only one component of the incredible, incredible breadth of IT at Harvard. So I'm excited that you're going to be able to see sessions that range from using data designed to improve our systems and processes, cybersecurity, digital accessibility, new platforms, updates on important projects, and much, much more. But as we think about fostering a culture of innovation, we need to continually ask ourselves how we create an environment in which we feel that we belong and places where we can do our best work. So I'm thrilled that we also have sessions on inclusion and belonging, strategies for effective and impactful work, project management, career advancement, and more. With so many amazing breakout sessions, I know it's going to be really hard to choose which one to go to. So I have some fabulous news for you. After the event, we will be distributing summaries of all the sessions so you can learn more about each topic, even if you cannot attend. So, oh, thank you for the applause for that. And also, Thanks to everyone that is providing the summaries. So thank you for that. Um, so ag agenda outline, uh, so we can just kind of step through it together. Um, in a few moments, we will bring our IT leadership panel, which is always an exciting uh, panel for us uh, that kicks us, in the kicks us off in the morning. 
At 10, we are going to disperse into our breakout sessions. Lunch will be available at 12.30. And then at, 13, at 3 15, we convene for the closing plenary session at, here in the Sanders Theater. So bring your questions, remember, you will be asked. And finally, at 4.30, we ga gather for our community reception. Let me just close and thank all of the people who make this IT Summit possible. It takes a village, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so let me first thank our host, the CIO Council. Make yourself known, wave your hands, they're out front. You can see them real easily. Um, thank you to our partner organizing this event, the Center for Digital Education. Are you here? Can you make yourself known? Or are they, they're, they're, oh, they're, they're outside actually, making sure that everything is going okay. Uh, so fabulous. Thank you to our event organizers, supporters, exhibitors, and our speakers, panelists, and session contributors. Let's wave hands so we can see the village that it takes to make this happen. All right. Thank you. Thank you to everyone that makes this possible. And thank to, thanks to all of you for taking part in this amazing event, because you make it a success, the fact that you come, the fact that you participate. So thank you so much for coming. And now, without any further delay, our first session is a panel of IT leaders from across the university, moderated by Stu Snydman, Associate University Librarian and Managing Director of Library Technology at Hewitt, also of Harvard Library. Ju Stu will be joined on stage by panelists and uh, fellow CIO Council members, Beth Clark, Chief Information Officer at Harvard Business School, Dan Hawkins, Ch uh, Chief Information Officer at Harvard Divinity School, Emily Bodis, Managing Director of Academic Technologies and Hewitt, and Mina Lakani, Chief Information Officer at Harvard Kennedy Sco School. Thank you, Stu, Beth, Dan, Emily, and Mina for joining us today. Please come up. Please welcome our CIO panel. All right, let's ask nobody trips nobody on the stairs. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Excellent, excellent. Um, really grateful to. Uh, be with you today and to um, have the opportunity to uh, moderate this, this panel with these, uh, these amazing leaders. Um, three objectives for the, for the conversation today. One um, is to get to know um, uh, these four kind of wonderful people and really effective leaders a little bit better. Um, two is to learn a little bit more about the CIO Council. Um, and three is to derive some kind of new insights from um, IT leaders at, at Harvard on what it's like to um, kind of navigate and lead in, in such a complex environment. So let's start by getting to know uh, the panelists. Um, and I'll ask each of you to just introduce yourself and, and, and tell us a little bit about um, you know, your, your, your professional journey to, to Harvard and through Harvard. Beth? Sure. Good morning, everybody. It's really great to see so many familiar faces and new faces as well. Really glad to be here and hope Stu doesn't throw too many curveballs at, at us, but I told him to actually throw curveballs at us. So, um, And I hope you do too. Ask us anything, really. Um, I've been at um, Harvard for the past 11 years. I'm in year 11 and I've had seven different roles at HBS um, and have enjoyed each one. And I've been in I've been in higher ed IT for, I'm, I'm embarrassed to, um, to say, but 25 years. And yeah, it's 25 years, and it's been just a, an amazing journey. I started more on the academic side, but grew to love kind of the complexity of IT organizations and, um, and the complexity of a place like Harvard. So I'll, I'll keep it short and simple because we've got a lot to cover, but. Great. Next blue suit, Dan. Dan. Next blue suit. All right. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm also honored to be here today. Um, I'm the CIO at the Divinity School, and I've spent most of my professional IT career at Harvard. Um, I began uh, at the college in 1996 uh, here um, as an AV technician, uh, setting up sound systems, projectors, microphones, 
uh, and actually on this very stage uh, way back then. And uh, spent, spent a little while at the college and then I headed over to HBS where I was there for a little bit with, uh, Beth was also there at that time and uh, worked as a uh, media technician and senior AV person uh, until about 2002 where I came to the Divinity School where uh, I began to take on uh, more broad uh, managerial and leadership roles, uh, managing other parts of the organization as well uh, as, as the, uh, the classroom and academic technology. Cool, Emily. All right, good morning everybody. Uh, Emily Bodis, Managing Director of Academic Tech at Hewitt. I've spent most of my time not at Harvard. It's a little juxtaposition. I began my career in computers uh, in third grade with my Commodore 64. Uh, went to computer camp, <laughs> took a lot of uh, social elevation there with the computer camp in middle school. Um, but when I graduated, I just began working in software development, and that is my specialty, has been custom software development. I started out working in government and built systems for state and, local, um, state and city governments. From there I went and was the director of interactive at the Museum of Science, and I was at, spent a few years at HBS Online working on their custom platform. And about 18 months ago, I joined, I'm still in the month phase, uh, like a child. Um, <laughs> I joined Hewitt as the managing director of um, academic technology. So very excited to be here. Cool, Mina. Yes, so my name is Farhat Lakwani, known as Mina. I have been in higher ed for many decades. Most of the time I actually spent uh, at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I uh, went to, is my voice too loud? No, this is good, okay. So I went to State University of New York uh, in Erie as uh, Vice Provost and CIO before coming to Harvard uh, Kennedy School about three and a half years ago. So I am a bit senior than you, quite a bit. And the CIO Council has been just amazing. When I arrived, uh, it was Anne Margulies who was the university CIO. I was very generous with her time and she, uh, we met regularly uh, before she left in a few months to really uh, teach me about Harvard's way of doing things. It's, it's really Harvard's way and grateful to the CIO Council uh, colleagues for uh, bringing me up to speed. So, yeah, that's where I. Cool, thanks, Mina. So, um, and just so folks know, we are gonna we're gonna end uh, we're gonna cut the Q and A uh, on stage at about quarter of and leave room for questions. So, as you listen to the panelists, kind of think of what hard hitting questions you want to ask. I think probably you put a pin in um, asking Emily a little bit more about programming on a Commodore sixty four. See if you resonate. <laughs> Um, but Mina mentioned the importance and impact of the CIO Council upon her arrival. Um, and uh, we thought maybe we'd take a little bit of a chance to uh, demystify, although Dan tells me it's not mystical. Um, uh, just kind of talk a little bit about the, the CIO Council. What is it? Um, what, is its, what is its role and how does it function? And maybe with a little bit of a his history. And Dan, as the longest running sitting member of the CIO Council, council it's, your, it's your honor to, to, to tell us a little bit more about CIO Council. Sure. Um, the CIO Council is really uh, composed of senior IT leaders, both including the professional school CIOs, as well as senior leaders from Hewitt Central Administration uh, and the FAS. And um, it, its current incarnation as, as the CIO Council really came about in fall of 2009, early spring of 2010, where prior to that, uh, it was kind of known as the CIO Standing Committee. and. Uh, some of my, my, my former colleagues joked that it was the CIO standing by committee because they didn't really do a lot. Uh, they just kind of came together once in a while and talked about a few things that they were doing. But um, really around that time, it really transformed into something that was much more uh, actively looking at how best to achieve the one Harvard vision as well as to look at all the innovation and uh, the work that's being done in the schools and try to balance those two things. And I, I think there's, there's a really good two-way flow between the schools and the center in a lot of ways, given that we can work together on things that we should be working together on, uh, enterprise systems and platforms and initiatives, and, but also at the same time um, have, have inputs from the schools where there's innovation uh, and experimentation and, 
and, and more creative work being done that we can evaluate together as a team to determine if, it's, if it makes sense for a wider um, rollout amongst uh, a broader Harvard community. Um, I, I think we annually, we, we set our, our priorities. We, we meet biweekly and we have annual retreats each year to look at uh, coming together and looking at the university priorities and what we should set as our strategic initiatives each year. Um, we, uh, the CTO's office and, and Hewitt and many other of you from across the university also are participating in producing horizon reports in a number of different areas that help inform us as to what's um, not only within Harvard but out in the broader IT community where we can, we can draw upon and be aware of the things that we should be paying attention to. Um, we, we currently have uh, strategic initiatives uh, this current year uh, in AV and classroom technology, asset management, collaboration tools, research computing, and generative AI. And there are specific CIO sponsors that are responsible for those and working with, with many of you uh, to advance those initiatives. Cool. Thanks, Dan. Um, so when I, I, I appreciate you mentioning the kind of, kind of one Harvard context um, of, of CIO Council. So I wonder if I can ask a question of a, of, of, of a few of you to kind of go a little bit deeper into that, um, into how you navigate, maybe with some, some examples, how you navigate kind of um, leading um, from your schools um, and leading the IT, a very kind of unique and distinctive um, um, school and institutional context, um, and at the same time, have a broader kind of one Harvard view. So what are some of the circumstances in which um, you need to make choices that are really local and contextual, and what are some of the circumstances where you feel like, you know, we need to take a broader kind of cross Harvard, Harvard view. And I'll ask, I'll ask Dan, Beth, and then, and then Emily, who kind of has a unique role on, on, on the CIO Council with a few, few others of us um, who, who sit on um, the senior leadership team in Hewitt and kind of serve the whole of Harvard. So um, maybe Dan, since you were just kind of on a roll, um, uh, Keep it going, and just talk a little bit more about that, kind of how you kind of reconcile those two um, those two dimensions of the work. Sure, and and there's there's naturally a broad uh, spectrum of of schools, and uh, from large to small, and simpler to more complex. And we are certainly at the the smaller end of the spectrum. So I think one of the advantages that um, that I feel that I have in being in this role at a small school is. I have the opportunity to personally serve on many of these different initiatives and working groups and committees that enable uh, that, that direct exposure to kind of see the intersections of all the work that's going on and to be able to uh, bring that to the CIO Council and, and perspectives that where things we could connect on that, that may, um, may be different at other, other schools. Um, I, I think uh, HDS also is a very long-standing and close partner with Hewitt for many, many shared services from field support to networking, DevOps, infrastructure, uh, and, and many others. So we, we have that close connection and partnership and are often in, in very close alignment with the central initiatives that, and, and platforms that are, that are rolled out. Okay, Beth. Thanks. Um, thanks, Dan. It's, it's nice to actually do a contrast of a, a smaller um, school to a school like HBS because we all have to kind of navigate and thread these things together, um, but we do them in different ways. And so HBS, um, if any, I don't know how many people know, but we operate most of our services independent of Hewitt. We do rely on Hewitt for a number of services, but mostly we provide our own for the HBS campus, which gives us a lot of freedom to innovate where the school really needs it or focus on very specific administrative or pedagogical uh, needs that are very distinctive to HBS. Um, but at the same time, I have to wear a hat, an enterprise hat and look across the university because we are not, we are not an island. We're on a different side of the, the river. Um, but the that side of the river is growing um, really, really quickly. We, you know, the science and engineering complex opened um, prior to the pandemic with 
seas moving over, and we have the Enterprise Research Campus that is opening um, relatively soon. And that is going to, we already have a lot of foot traffic, right, across the university, whether it's faculty, staff, or students, they're coming in and across. And so if I don't really think from a customer point of view, and we as an organization don't think about, from a customer point of view, about Harvard as the customer, then um, I think it would be a much more difficult uh, place to kind of come in and out of. And so we really have to stay in strategic alignment with where the university is going, really connected to the mission, connected to the direction that Hewitt is taken, taking. And if there's any, if we're going to go in a different direction, that has to be a really deep conversation around why. And there has to be good rationale for it. Because again, the customer has to be at the center of what we do. So um, I hope that gives you a flavor yeah, of yeah, you know, the difference on the other side of things. And Emily, your perspective? So from my position in the center, you know, I view our role as providing services, the services that everyone needs that you don't want to spend time on, right? So that you can spend time with your faculty and students and meet your individual mission. And honestly, when I got here, the relationship between the schools and the center was something I was worried about. You know, I think traditionally it's like the center is stodgy and difficult. And well, sometimes that happens. And, you know, <laughs> you know, the schools are like innovative and going off. But I think with the CIO Council and just how we work, we've really been able to make good decisions and allow the schools to be innovation centers and to bring things into the, you know, into the center when everyone can use it. I think we've done that quite a bit. And I think that you know, the CIO Council really absolutely you know, promotes that type of uh, working together. Awesome. Are there examples of, of, of some of that bringing back from the schools to the to the, the broader institutional context that you all can think of? So we have a, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, I was sorry, no. uh, we have a project called Teachly that started in the Kennedy School that now is coming to Hewitt uh, in the center at, out of Academic Technologies One. Uh, cool, yeah. cool, thanks. Um, does everybody know what Teachly is? Sorry. Sure. No? Mina, do you want to say, do, yep. either, you say yeah, what Teachly so, is? Of course. Uh, so Teachly was, uh, it started at uh, Kennedy School by one of our uh, uh, faculty member and it, it, it became quite, uh, Dan Levy is the faculty member who was chairing it along with other faculty and it became a big success. And it's a t he developed a tool uh, uh, based on Zoom to teach more effectively. And that was lifted at a central level. And now it is being used uh, across Harvard by many, uh, many courses. Cool. Yeah. Cool, thanks. All right, so, so, so I wanna kind of change the topic a little bit. Thanks for that kind of briefing on the importance of, of, um, of the CIO Council and the relationship with the schools and the broader university context. I want to hear a little bit more about the things that are influencing you and, and your work. So what are some of the, um, maybe pick one, um, kind of powerful outside forces that are affecting you and your team's work? And there's one rule to the answer to this question. It cannot be AI <laughs> or uh, information security threats. So those two are off the table, but you can, anything else is on the table. So what are some of the big influences? Um, what, what's, a big in, what, what's influencing the way you're kind of leading your organization and navigating technology today? Um, start with Mina. Okay, yes. So one of the, what I worry about is uh, the budget aspect of it. So we know technology is, uh, has been moving at a rapid pace and it's not slowing down any uh, time in the near future. And VIT professionals are kind people. We want to make the world better for everyone. So we want to do lots of things and uh, experiment and try roll out services. So it's the budget part that keeps the boundaries all around it. So that's something that I worry about it. At uh, the Kennedy School at HKS, we have a five-year strategic plan that was approved in 2022. And that is synced with the multi-year financial plan, five-year multi-year 
financial plan so that it stays in sync. And then every year we re review with the leadership uh, team to see what we really want to drop, what we want to add. And uh, it's the budget part that we, uh, for that reason, we have to reprioritize it, prioritize it again and again to make sure that we, what we are doing is aligned. So since talking about budget, I also want to mention that uh, at a Harvard level, we have multi-year technology plan that uh, Clara introduced after her arrival uh, three years ago almost, and now it has been fine-tuned since that, since that time. So having those two uh, at a university level, multi-year technology plan, at, and at uh, Kennedy School level, uh, multi-year uh, financial plan gives us uh, quite some, uh, uh, um, get, allow us to do more strategy and to work around it. So, so beside the technology, I worry about the budgets. <laughs> we are not HBS. <laughs> 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 All right, there it is. There it is. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> 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 that was going to happen. Yeah, it's, it only took, there, it took 33 minutes. Um, uh, cool. Uh, Emily, <laughs> what's on your mind? I know. Yeah, right? <laughs> so I actually, as someone who works with teams who are developing software and the learning and teaching space, that, really, can I, I have two things that I can mention? Yeah, you, you can said have two things. Okay. So the first one really is the attention economy, and specifically reduced focus and polarization. So we're building this online learning platform called the LXP. There's many sessions today about it, so I'm not going to go into it. But when we're building that, we, like, what is our responsibility to show viewpoint diversity through the system? Social learning is something that this system is going to do. How do we make sure that we're not just creating an echo chamber? Similarly, there are techniques that we can use that will make you pick up your phone every 25 seconds. Like, I don't have mine on me right now, and I'm like, where is it? And so, do we, is that okay to use those techniques in the service of teaching and learning is a big question. And the second one is really people who, not people, but the desire to use technology to solve problems that it's not really well suited to solve. I remember when I was in the sixth grade, we got an Apple II computer in the classroom. And the teacher was like, we got this really cool program, y'all. We're going to actually dissect a frog using the Apple IIe in a program. It sucked. It was horrible. <laughs> like, it was ASCII art. Like, it was just a horrible thing. But what actually was cool was dissecting a real frog. And so when we're asked to build something, how do we make sure that what we're building is not that program of dissecting a frog on the Apple IIe, right? We need to prototype, we need to instruct, and make sure the technology and our resources are being used in the most impactful way. Yeah, yeah, we have some really cool, impactful hammers. We don't always need to use them for everything, right? So I, I want to follow up, though, quickly, Emily, and maybe it's for any of you. You asked the question, is it a, back to the attention uh, economy, which is really interesting. You asked, is it OK to use those techniques? Is it? It is at the business school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I know. I'm kidding. This doesn't seem fair. I, <laughs> I feel like maybe I'm losing control. <laughs> You're going to get your turn, Beth. You're going to get your turn. <laughs> you can tell like, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I know it's a it's a it's a complicated yeah, it's a good, question, which is why yeah. you raise. Well, it's yeah, a complicated yeah. question, which is why you raise it. But it's really it's really yeah. interesting because there are all these new techniques, and we do know that it's soundbite economy and the and the, yeah. the phone phone economy. And I'm wondering if any of the rest of you, as you're thinking about rolling out technologies, um, is this does this resonate? This kind of change in the way um, in in the way learners and researchers are expecting to use technology relative to the way they use it in in kind of their everyday life. Go ahead, Mina. <laughs> we definitely talk about it, right? We, yeah. we know that. It's a discussion. It's part of when we work with faculty on building features for this learning platform. It is something that we bring up. And we, you know, specifically viewpoint diversity, we're designing features so that you can't just look at, you know, everyone answered A. You know, show me what, 
they thought, you have to, we are going to build out viewpoint diversity specifically. The techniques are a little bit different. I think what we're, what we're, we're going to land is we're going to put that control in the end user's hand. They can decide for their notifications. They can decide how they want to get this information. That's where we're ending up, but it's constantly evolving. Nice, nice, thanks. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna move on. Um, wanna kind of move from the outside influences to peer, uh, peer institutions and what we can kind of bring and learn from, from our peers. Um, so I wanna ask a, a couple of you to talk a little bit about, you know, cause there's a, Harvard's amazing, but it's an amazing kind of, um, kind of world out there with, with lots of amazing institutions and peers. So, Talk to us a little bit about how you engage with your professional, some of the ways in which you engage with your professional um, and peer communities outside of Harvard. Maybe what's an example of something you or, or we at Harvard have learned, um, or maybe um, we think we should or can learn from, from our peers that we, we haven't quite yet. Beth, do you want to start? Me, okay, yeah. Mina's gonna start. Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, for IT professionals, it's really important for all of us to continue to learn and from each other. There is a lot going on and we all look at things from different perspective. And so networking within our schools, within Harvard, as you said, Stu, is important, but it's also very important to see what's going on outside. Uh, in the world or in the country or at, at other uh, peer schools. So, for example, something that has helped me a lot is Educause is, uh, is a professional organization. It's one of the largest community of uh, educators and uh, IT professionals and leaders uh, who uh, work together to enhance the mission of uh, higher ed. So that... Uh, has uh, been extremely helpful in the sense that uh, I have uh, been on the different advisory committees. Right now, I'm on the CIO advisory committee for Educause and uh, got the opportunity to make presentations and webinars. So it's not just learning and it's also taking and giving back. So it's quite a collegial. Uh, community and uh, Harvard has a membership, Educause membership. So if any of you uh, want to get involved, uh, check it out because we pay for uh, university membership at a university level. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's just one example of how, uh, and there are many other examples, but it is good to network with different type of uh, colleagues with different perspectives. Yeah, sure. And I, I actually wanted to go after Mina on purpose for, for a very specific reason. Educause, I knew she was going to talk about Educause, and that is also a, a community I participate in. Um, and many of you do as well, um, as well as the kind of the local organization um, in Massachusetts, well, in the Northeast region, NERCOM. Um, but I, I wanted to actually give, um, you know, some props to Mina because I have a peer group. I actually just came back from a peer group meeting, um, and it's 25 business schools from across the U.S. and three international schools participate. And this is actually, and we meet twice a year. And aside from being sort of a large group therapy session, it's <laughs> all the pain, all the joys and woes, right? We get to share that with one another. We also really learn from one another in a I guess, um, discipline-specific context. We really focus on bu business education and how technology is influencing that. But I, I wanted to give Mina props because she was actually one of the founding members of this group. And I find this group to be incredibly valuable, even though you know the, the schools are wildly different from one another. Um, and they like to poke fun at HBS as much as you know, CIO Council does. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned so much. In fact, we have a meeting later today with um, folks from Kellogg because of something that we discussed at the meeting. It was like, Raghu, I really would like to follow up with you on this and want to, you know, learn from what your team has done. And so I think that it's just, and we have to take those outside influences and bring them in because there are a lot of people doing amazing things across 
um, the higher education space. And so, um, again, thank you, Nina, because uh, I, I have a really nice peer group. But I think it is just so, so critical for us to constantly be learning from one another. Yeah, yeah, great, thanks. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask one more question before we, we go to the audience. And I think a thread kind of throughout all this is there's just, there's just so much kind of, kind of going on. There's, there's so much out there in the world, either external pressures, things we can learn from others, kind of innovation, and Clara mentioned in her opening, you know, how this group, um, the, IT, um, the I, I, IT folks at, at, at Harvard are, are really leaning into kind of innovation. Um, and at the same time, we need to keep this place, you know, you all need to keep this place running, right? So there can be, and especially as we kind of manage our, our work, some tension between, um, between maintaining kind of operational effectiveness and keeping all those core systems running and then also absorbing and consuming all of the inputs that are coming from the outside and trying to be leaders and innovators. So can any of you talk a little bit about how you think about and how you navigate that, that kind of dichotomy of, of wanting to be a leader in IT and, and innovating um, and at the same time really needing to be focused on operations and security and keeping, um, keeping all the core business of the institution running. And we did not have an order for this one, so who wants to jump in? I don't mind jumping in on this yeah, one, yeah. Uh, because I, I think of operations, sorry, um, I think of operations as your bread and butter, right? And if you, if you don't get that right, you can't innovate. And so always making sure that um, that's so core, like the business would not be able to partner with IT if operations weren't solid. And so um, I think about operations is so essential. Um, and if you get that right, then you do free up time for, um, you know, doing really growing and transforming the business, right? So um, for me, it's like we have to pay, we have to make sure that we're really strong in that space. Um, and because that does give us, it affords us the opportunity to work with the business in different ways because they trust us because they don't worry about, you know, security incidents or whether, you know, I'm looking over at our friends and media services, whether events are going to go well or whatnot. So, um, you know, those are, um, again, that's my bread and butter. And, uh, and, and I hope that we do it really well so that we can partner yeah. in a different way. Mina? Yeah, so we define innovation in a slightly creative way that, uh, and continue. So we have mixed it with operations and we continuously look at it and see how can we do it better. And then that becomes innovation because we are keep on challenging it. Is this how we want to continue to do? Or is there a better way of doing it? So that has uh, been like uh, the HKS IT leadership team. We talk about those kind of things quite a bit uh, on the AV side specifically uh, that uh, Dan had mentioned. Uh, there has been continuous uh, innovation on, it's not like big thing, but all those little, little things just add up. So on, uh, you know, so I can give examples of other ones, but it is, we define it at a micro level, more like, you know, how do we, it's more like continuous improvement, but just we go a little step further. So we are uh, intentionally questioning it. Dan, can I ask, oh, Emily, you wanna go? Yeah. Dan, no, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, we can't continue to add new things without taking things away. So we need to continually rationalize our portfolios and decide what we need to remove. And we've actually, in academic technology and Hewitt, we've removed a couple of systems there. And so that's been really important. And then I think with custom software development, things that we've built internally, operations is the beginning of innovation. They're closest to the end users in a lot of cases, and they start the innovation on how we should improve what we should be building because they have that experience with the end user. So I view it as a cycle, and every part is kind of part of that, you know, tied together. Just quickly, one of the challenges for us as a small school is we don't necessarily have a software development team. So I, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're very closely aligned with you on a lot of different areas, and participation on governance groups and steering committees and different initiatives to provide the input, and for us primarily to really 
understand our community and the needs that we have and bring that to the discussions in terms of when we do have the ability to partner with, uh, with Hewitt and other groups on, on these systems. All right, we are at uh, 15 minutes before the hour. Um, we've, we've done enough of the, the pre-canned questions. So now it's your turn. Um, we've covered a lot of ground. So uh, over to you, who's got questions on any topic we covered or haven't covered for, um, for this amazing panel? And the lights are a little bright, so I'm gonna have a little bit of a hard time seeing. So raise hands and there are mic runners, both, um, in the balcony as well as uh, in the main auditorium and also I don't know if anybody's in the little lecture hall but um, there as well. So who's got, uh, who's got questions? Uh, I think I see one right there. And it, yeah, yeah the, there we go, stand up, that's right. Standing up is great and uh, if you could introduce yourself that would be awesome. Good morning, thank you for this very interesting discussion. <laughs> um, I'm curious to dive a little bit deeper into the uh, conversation that we were having around the schools as innovators and uh, experimenters and um, navigating the um, relationship to one Harvard and um, bringing common solutions together that can be used enterprise-wide. I'm curious if you can bring that to the context of the faculty relationship as well. There's a lot of innovation happening at the faculty level, researchers that are really bringing new technologies, approaches, experimentation. How do you navigate that tension, right? Where they're really at the leading edge, really looking to push boundaries and try new things. How do you accommodate that while also navigating this need to have common enterprise solutions and staying within financial boundaries and strategic objectives for the university? Um, I'm just curious if you could expound a little bit on that and how you navigate that tension. It's a great question. So uh, I gave the example of uh, Teachly, which uh, uh, at the Kennedy School was developed by the faculty member and the local team uh, provides and nurture some of those uh, uh, initiatives. And once we see there is enough value, there's active conversation going on with uh, Hewitt Central, and uh, we also have a process of getting funding that's called ITCRB to get funding for those initiatives at the school level that need to be brought up at uh, Harvard level, if it makes sense. So there are, there are some processes that are being set up, but like one there is currently, uh, we are working on at the Kennedy School with uh, Emily Boris and others to really look at it and, and evaluate. So that's, there is faculty uh, support and connection and process that is set up. And most of the faculty support, direct support is provided at a school level and at a center level as well, but there's also uh, this innovation aspect of it that get collectively discussed at the CIO Council. And um, so, yeah, so uh, faculty are very important community for uh, us, and we do pay lots of attention to it, though we didn't talk about it at this time. Cool. Emily? Yeah, so this is something we think a lot about because Hewitt, is central IT, but it's also the IT provider directly for FAS. And so within academic technology, we have a team dedicated to working with faculty just with, at FAS. And so it's something we think about a, a lot. I do think that there's a, a mystique that like faculty are monolithic. You know, what we've seen with AI is that we have some faculty who really want to run ahead and do things and people who are like, please put a Faraday cage over my classroom. And so when we think about that, we need to provide solutions that kind of meet that range. And so with the sandbox, with AI, for example, we built a sandbox so that any faculty member could get it and understand AI in a safe, secure, and data, with data privacy. Simultaneously, we created API access for the, for the faculty members with teams who wanted to go fast and forward and build their own thing. So we, we really need to think about it as, how do we meet the range of faculty needs? And that means we have different solutions uh, across the board. Thanks, that was a great question. Uh, right here, kind of lower center. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Naveen Reddy from FAS. Uh, I thought I should ask the question on AI. So, uh, so apart from uh, the sandbox and some of the pilots happening in the AI space, uh, what are some tangible things you've done at your schools and where do you see AI going in the next five years? And wh what are you anticipating in your world, especially with budgets and other things? So. Great, thanks for that question. AI is back on the table. <laughs> I don't mind starting with that one. Um, I think at HBS there has been an incredible amount of demand um, from the faculty um, and the administration, but the faculty um, primarily to prepare, because our, our mission is to educate leaders who make a difference in the world, right? And so they're coming into business school, they'll go out into companies and they need to be able to be um, fluent in these technologies. And so there's been a, a lot of demand for getting this into the classroom in meaningful ways. And that's where some of the experimentation around the tutor bots um, has, start, has been going on. And that's also where we you know, turn to partner with the center to say, okay, we've done experimentation. How might we scale for a broader audience? Um, but we've also brought tools into the space like ChatGPT, Microsoft Copilot, 365, um, those kind of tools so that they have the tools and the students have the tools to really learn how to integrate them in meaningful and helpful ways into the environment. Um, so I would say we're probably on the aggressive side of integration of Gen AI into um, the, the ecosystem. Um, I don't know what it's going to look like in five years. Um, I hope we don't reach the singularity before then. <laughs> uh, so, um, but I think it's going to, for, for us, I think we're really trying to think deeply about how it is going to change every single job in IT across the school, um, teaching and learning, research, um, engagement. So, uh, yeah. Anybody want to make the case for the singularity in the next five years? <laughs> no? Okay, good. So I want to mention that Clara has intentionally done a great job of pulling together uh, Harvard level uh, communities for teaching and learning, for research, for administration, so that we are collectively working together and thinking about it. And then uh, in addition to that, we have uh, other uh, committees within the school. So at Kennedy School, we have an AI uh, committee where we get together and talk about it and plan for it. It's a challenging, uh, it's a very fluid uh, landscape and uh, it, I'm interested in seeing what happens in five years. <laughs> All right, anybody else? All right, I'm gonna put my hand on my forehead again. Okay, I see one right there, same middle section, a third of the way up on the right, my right. Don't forget to introduce yourself, thanks. Hi, I'm Rachel Dalby from the School of Public Health, and I had a question in terms of the dynamics between the different schools and how COVID kind of changed that and whether or not um, COVID promoted more of a one Harvard type um, mentality, I guess, as like other smaller schools might not have had the equipment, so to speak, or that technology there to like go that remote and everything. Do you think that due to COVID that there is a bigger promotion of the one Harvard or is it kind of can, you know, stayed consistent or anything like that? That's an interesting question. Who wants to start with that one? I guess I can jump in again, because I know that um, during COVID, we spent a lot of time on building a hybrid classroom that would fit the pedagogical model of HBS, because honestly, the business was, there was not going to be a business if we did not have uh, that model in place. And uh, I think what transpired, I don't know if it, um, it probably further deepened the uh, one Harvard approach, because it, um, once we had that built, I think we just tried to share it across the board um, to make sure that, you know, we weren't, you know, keeping state secrets or anything. It was really like, okay, we built this, it may work for you. 
here's what we've learned, and I think the learnings and sharing the learnings, because they're different in different environments, have been um, really, really, really critical. But I think the, the year after that, we spent just so much time across the university talking with other schools and, and, um, and Hewitt about what, um, what we had done. So. I would just quickly add that um, these, these digital platforms like Zoom and other uh, applications really made it very easy to facilitate collaboration across the university. But in addition to kind of the digital realm, we also have a physical campus. So we, there were many, many groups and uh, the AV and Classroom Technology Initiative really picked up steam after we returned from, uh, from COVID and there's a lot of work going on in that area to share knowledge and expertise as, as Beth mentioned so that we can have all of our spaces be ready to facilitate hybrid, which in many cases is just an expectation now. So uh, that, that aspect of it really has, has uh, in, in the quarters of AV and classroom technology, there's really a lot of work going on there to bring all of our systems to a better standard that really makes that, that experience more seamless for, for everybody everywhere. Cool. All right. So I'm mindful of time and want to um, want to give you all time to socialize. So this has been a really, really, really compelling and interesting conversation. Want to just do one last round of um, maybe briefly closing thoughts, reflections, um, maybe kind of words of words of wisdom from the the panel as we close. Want to start with Mina? Yes. Uh, I strongly encourage all of you to network and uh, communicate. This is an excellent opportunity, IT Summit, to really get to know your colleagues outside of your school. And uh, you know, great kudos to Steph and her team for pulling it together. It takes lots of effort. So let's make the best out of it and have an amazing day. Great, thanks. Emily? You know, it's a very exciting time to be in IT with AI and, you know, a myriad of technologies that are just coming on board. And I think working at Harvard and at the schools is the best place to be. It, there's so many resources here to learn, the extension school, online. Anyone that up here would be willing to talk to anyone. I think this is just, in terms of learning, we just are at a really pivotal moment. And I encourage everyone to take advantage of that um, as much as you can. Cool. Thanks, Dan. I would just uh, thank all of you for the work that you all do in, in so many ways for, to support the mission of the university. Um, seeing and, and knowing so many of you for many years and working on all of these different projects, it's amazing the dedication and just the, the energy that you all bring to support the important work of the entire university and your respective schools. So um, I would just uh, challenge you all to, to bring all of your ideas to your to your respective IT leaders. Cool. And Beth, I'm giving you the last word. Last word. Don't you get the last word? Well, yeah. But. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe just building upon what they've already said. As I look at the sea of faces out here and, and the power that's in the room, I would, you know, sometimes we get really stuck in our day-to-day -day or in our environment, and I would... Um, have you all think just regularly about the university of the universe of possibility that exists at a place like Harvard and how you can take advantage of that? Because there is a, a very vast universe of possibilities um, in this room and beyond. So I thank you for being here, and um, and I hope you really enjoy the day. Cool. Um, okay. I have some announcements to make, some kind of logistical announcements to make, but before I get to those, so I do wanna just thank this amazing panel. I feel super fortunate to get to work with these folks and everybody in the CIO Council um, pretty regularly, and it's really fun to sit up here and just kind of hear from you and learn from you. And um, so just join me in thanking the panel for their, their time. Okay. Cool, thanks. Okay, so now the, the, the logistics. Um, so we're gonna break. You're gonna have the chance to socialize and network and see friends old and new. Um, the next on the program are breakout sessions at 10.15 and then directly following at 11.30. Um, just a reminder, 
You need to display your conference badge for entry into Harvard Yard and Wasserstein Hall um, at HLS. Um, you can find the breakout titles, time slots, locations on the schedule um, at a glance that you received at registration. Um, and of course, there's initial, uh, 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 there's uh, detailed information at itsummit.harvard.edu. Um, after the two breakouts that are next, box lunches will be available for pickup um, in both Memorial Hall as well as the Annenberg survey, uh, Servery. Um, if, if you have any dietary restrictions um, or any other questions, the staff from Crimson Catering can help. Um, and then don't forget the exhibit hall. The exhibit hall, which maybe you've seen, I hope, in Annenberg, um, will be open during lunch. Um, and for lunch, seating is available in the Science Center tent and the basement of Memorial Hall. Um, and additional reception tables are available in Annenberg. Um, one program note, um, there was one session that unfortunately had to be canceled due to um, um, one of the presenters not, not feeling well. This is the, um, the, the session on integrating collaboration equity into the hybrid workplace. But, uh, so that unfortunately won't happen today, but uh, the group that was gonna offer that, um, that session has offered um, to give it at a later time. So we'll get to, we'll get to, we'll get to have that. So um, that's it, we're at 10.03, that's a good time. Let's break for a break. <laughs>